Bobbish. Um, welcome to my talk. My name is Markus, um, and yeah, I have a role which I will, in the end, get myself, which is called a software evolutionist. So I'm the one who isn't running away when someone calls uh, us as a client, for example, and says, "Hey, we have a legacy system here. Can you take a look at it? Um, can you give some tips and how to modernize this kind of stuff?" This is right where I come into play. And one thing I like to do is to take a data-driven yeah, view on this kind of legacy software. And this is what the talk is about, how to actually get the data out of software system, systems, out of, around the processes, around developing a software system. And to set the mood right, I want to introduce you to the right kind of area where we are, the legacy systems, the power shows that we all face today. And you know, but these kind of systems, because of all the patches, all the additions that were actually done for several years, uh, for, for all the years and so on. And yeah, actually we need to do something about this and improve those, these kind of systems. But actually it's really hard, as you might know, because yeah, there are plenty of problems in these kind of legacy systems, but it's a really, really kind of a mean category of problems. So if you take a look at this, what we're actually facing are uh, different kind of competing tasks around developing and modernizing and evolving a software system. So for example, we have of course all the features that have to get into this kind of software system where we need to add some code to make our customers happy. Um, this is some area where nobody would say, hey, stop building, into in, uh, stop building features into your software system because they give us money and they are easily can be seen from a customer's side or from the end users. Absolutely no problem. We have also errors, bugs, for example, in our software system. They take money out of the software system. They can also be easily seen by users. So I should no problem to get rid of them. Now it gets a little bit trickier because architecture, for example, yeah, cannot be seen by the end users. But nowadays, I think it's a common belief that architecture provides value, even if you don't can actually yeah, see it as a user. But where we need, for example, software-driven or data-driven software analysis is this kind of area. So all the strange things that are down there <laughs> where nobody actually knows what is happening in our software systems, all the weird things, the stuff, and it's really mean because it takes up money, but nobody can see it. And this is where software analytics and, in the end, data science and software data comes into play because with these kind of toolings, with these kind of methods, we can try to make those stuff in the end visible again. Also not for non, uh, also not for only developers, but also for non-developers in the best case. So the goal of software analytics is in the end to bridge this kind of communication gap between management and development. And I did kind of research uh, for this several years ago, and my first attempt was in the end to build the ultimate software quality dashboard. So my main idea, first approach for analyzing data uh, on software systems was to find the ultimate metric, for example, that can show us with my, my traffic lights, like it red, orange, or green, how we are doing with the software system. But in the end, this somehow didn't work because when I actually got into this topic, um, I saw that these kind of metrics are very context dependent, for example. So it varies very on the situations where you uh, use this kind of measurements for your software system. And there is actually not the holy grail of measuring a software system in the end. Um, and that's, yeah, what I found out the hard way because I was in the middle of my master thesis and I had to kind of pivot the topic a little bit. But fortunately, um, because I was actually really interested in this kind of analysis, I yeah, come ac came across an area which is actually the basis for this kind of analysis I want to show you today. This is empirical software engineering in the end. Um, empirical software engineering tries to you know, actually get, um, actually gather some data um, around the processes of software development from the software system itself and try to analyze this kind of stuff to get a yeah, valid and a great basis for making decisions in the end. There's even a very practical area for this kind of stuff, um, which was not long 
ago from Brimson far away, um, defined in the end from Tormentius and Thomas Zimmerman. And they defined a term, uh, a special area in the part of empirical software engineering, which is called software analytics. What is software analytics in the end? Yeah, they said software analytics is analytics on software data for managers and software engineers with the aim of empowering software development individuals and teams to gain and share insight from their data to make better decisions. And when I read this kind of um, definition, immediately some of those terms caught my eye because, for example, they mentioned exactly the things I was also trying to fix. So bridging kind of the communication gap between managers and software engineers. And there's also the solution they wanted to yeah, use data for doing this kind of stuff. And this, again, caught my attention. So in the end, I give it another try based on the data that comes out of the software systems to find out what is actually happening, what are the problems in our legacy systems. So what is the kind of difference between the tools we already have in our industry and in the end using these kind of very specific analysis kind of techniques? Um, there are plenty of questions out there, let's say this way, um, which we need to answer during software development. So, for example, uh, is my public API documented, for example? So, these kind of questions, yeah, so those kind of general questions, occur very frequently. And of course, there are some tools out there who can actually validate or give us some hints if there's something, something missing. So, for example, code detection tools or static code analysis tools. These are these kind of tools fall into this category um, because yeah, there are questions out there every software developer has in the end. So it makes sense to build a product, to make it open source, for example, and release it to the public in the end. But it could be that in your specific situations, um, these kind of questions that are occurring very frequently aren't actually important to you, to your certain context in the end. So it could be like this, that there is a question that isn't getting asked several times a day by the whole industry, but just for your specific system that you have, that you need to modernize, that you need to improve. So we have two options for this. You can say, oh, there are no problems because my software tool doesn't show it to me in this nice traffic lights, which are green orange or red. And this is something that I don't like in the end. Because, yeah, if my tool that I bought in the end doesn't show anything, and I have still problems, yeah, those problems will actually haunt me in the end. So another approach would be to use for those specific questions yeah, your own analysis in the end. For example, by using software analytics. So to answer your very specific questions in the end. So this is the second approach which I want to introduce you to and how you can do this in the end without yeah, buying um, costly license, um, very expensive licenses, for example, or yeah, programming the whole day. Because what I want to show you is how you can base this kind of stuff on standard tools that are already out there and very good supported from a yeah, great community in the end. So what I'm talking about if I say there are questions out there that cannot be covered from standard tools. So, some issues that need to be terminated, for example, are, for example, things like uh, sporting parts in the source code nobody knows anymore of in the end. Um, could be a great kind of thing if you want to get rid of your external software consultants um, and yeah, you want to actually let them write some documentation or you want to pair with them to transfer some knowledge. And this could be one of those analysis you want to take. You could also, oh, oh yeah, danger zone. Oh, you have to be, uh, okay, of course, aware of laws and ethical kind of stuff. So if you actually want to analyze, for example, when somebody has his or her lunch um, based on Gitlog data, because um, during, I don't know, 12 a.m., they don't commit anything. Pay attention to your company's kind of compliance requirements um, because otherwise you will get into a judgment day. So maybe you get fired if you do this kind of analysis very deeply. Um, so just take a look at, for example, the Working Council 
that everything is fine with them as well. So it's just as a hint that you will get that everything that can be analyzed um, should be analyzed and is allowed to be analyzed in the end. But back to your topic, um, what you can also do, for example, is to find root causes of performance bottlenecks. So imagine you have a profiler in a place and you're measuring some performance measures in the end and you get out some big call graphs, for example, where you see which kind of method calls um, which other methods um, in your Java class, for example. And this is kind of a huge forest. And then you have to find this one tree in the end that is causing all the performance bottlenecks for the whole application. So you could browse do those kind of trees and these kind of graphs in the end manually, or you can write your own analysis that gets deep down to the root causes of a performance problem. That could be something that a standard tool doesn't provide because it doesn't have the knowledge to actually guide you to this kind of root causes of your performance bottlenecks. So maybe you have to write your own analysis again. You can also reason about alternative modernization options of your software system. Maybe you have a structure of a software system that doesn't fit anymore to the organization of your teams. There you can play around with this. We will take um, a little bit of a, yeah, a short, or, or I will show you a little example um, how you can do this using graph databases, for example. What I also like to show you today is to show the progress of long living um, restructurings. So the same applies with this kind of stuff that product managers doesn't see. So if you are restructuring your software system, let's say to another architecture style, this takes a while, uh, takes time, takes money, but in the end your product manager doesn't see that there is something going on. And maybe you want to use these kind of specific analysis to show them how you are doing in the end. Or you are choosing between libraries from the open source community and you want to get a hint how active a community around the open source library is. Yeah, there, yeah, there are some platforms out there that can you provide some basic data. But for um, comparing all the different sources that are like um, activities, bullet import, um, boards, or uh, developer lists, uh, isn't something that standard tools can do. Maybe you have to write your own uh, analysis for this. Could be. But what you also see is that there are plenty of stuff that you can do in the end, and how it depends on your specific needs. So, yeah, these are rare questions in the end that only you might have in your specific situation. So this makes it also really interesting to dive into this topic because then you can analyze your very specific needs or the things that you want to know. <coughs> all right, so I'm already talking about a huge amount of uh, kind of data, software data, what we um, might have in our environment. But just take a brief look what this kind of data is, is actually. Um, so we take a look at the data of a team of software developers in the end, and there are specific categories, for example. Um, there is static data, for example, so our code, that would be yeah, this kind of category. We can take a, a look at this, we can take a look at our tests, for example, we can take a look at um, data, this is, which is kind of a docu documentary kind of style, and we can analyze this kind of stuff. We can take a look at yeah, runtime data. So maybe we measured something via a profiler in our application, or we had some log files from our servers where we want to get a hint where we have some traffic spikes, for example. We have some chronological data, everything with a timestamp, I would say, like Git repositories, something that goes into, a his, into the history of our software system. And community data, as I mentioned before, this is, these are the kind of data like from Stack Overflow, uh, from GitHub and so on, to measure how a project, an open source project, for example, is doing. And this is the kind of data that's already available. Um, the nice thing is, we don't have to do anything for this because we are gathering and collecting this the whole time without knowing it. Um, but if you pay attention to this kind of data and what actually the, um, this kind of data, if analyzed, can um, actually get you answers for. It's pretty inter interesting what you already have in the end. 
Another kind of um, part that we need now, if you have the data, we need in the end a, a kind of way how we can analyze this data in a structured way. I think every one of you already wrote a bash script to analyze some data, yes, but the next day you don't know what you did the day before. Um, but this is not the things that we want to do, because we need to build um, analysis in the end that we, not only we can understand the next day, but that also others can understand. Because the whole goal of this kind of analysis is to, yeah, to start some improvement work um, in your software system, where you then also want to kind of communicate this, um, yeah, the efforts needed for improving your software systems to non-developers as well. And this brought me to a topic where we can, in the end, really, really specifically uh, solve this kind of analysis by using data science, of course. Why data science? Yeah, um, it's in the end something that we already do, I think, as software developers, because um, if you take a look at a Venn diagram from Drew Conway, he defined data science, for example, um, that um, as one part that we need math and statistics knowledge. So in our training, I think, that we had in a, at a university, at school, we already did some kind of the stuff here. So already software engineers are into data science a little bit. We have also some hacking skills that are also needed for data science. So writing down a script, for example, not a nice fully fledged application, but just the little things. Um, writing some blue code, this is what is needed as well in a data science area. And I think we can do this as well. And substantial expertise or domain expertise in the area where we want to analyze the data. Hey, we are software engineers, so we know how our stuff is working, I hope. So we have this kind of expertise already. And if you take these kind of these circles together, yeah, and let it overlap, we see, oh, we are not so far away as software engineers from the role of a data scientist, for example, because the things that are needed are already part of our jobs as well. So data science would be a perfect fit for this. I, I, I thought several years ago, and then, yeah, got right into this topic as well. But it's not only the kind of methodology, the, the broad kind of things we can do, but we have also to pay attention, have also to pay attention to how we work on our analysis. <coughs> As I told you before, it's easy to write an analysis script for the first time, but repeating it for other sets of data of the same kind, for example, uh, is something that you have to pay attention to as well, because maybe you want to reuse some kind of analysis in your own company again and again, maybe you want to show some progress that problems get uh, kind of away with time, then you need a solid foundation as well. So add reproduci reproduci reproducibility um, to data science, and then we have it in the end. So the idea is, because we are software engineers, that we analyze our kind of data in an open and automated way. That means, because we don't do data science on a daily basis, we need to get our analysis across or share, get shared with others so that they can get or they can give us feedback in the end um, and comprehensible and systematic. Um, we want to actually build analysis that can withstand uh, critique in the end. So if someone says, hey, it isn't the way that you tell me, uh, the best case would be then that you show your analysis to these kind of people and they can understand that your analysis is yeah, made in a robust way and can actually convince people to give you money for improving things. So not just data science, but a certain way um, that we have to focus on, which will also get um, important to the tool side of data science, because there we have to pick the right tool that enables this kind of reproducible data science for us as well. So that look at some tools that could actually implement this kind of software analytics for us. And I have to say, it's kind of a non-brainer if you look at the area of data science. There are actually two kind of competitors, I would say, nowadays, um, and for several years, like Python and R. So R is more or less for mathematicians who want to do uh, software engineering, 
and I would say Python is more like for software engineers who want to do some data science. And naturally, of course, because I'm a Java programmer in the end, I chose the later one, um, a data science stack with Python and Pandas. So Python, for example, for me as a Java developer, is a great programming language because you can get so much done in very few amount um, of lines of code in the end. So that's a choice if you program the whole if you program the whole way in let's say Java Enterprise Edition, um, you write down like ten lines of Java code the whole day, and then you sit down and do some analysis in Python, um, which is kind of very fluently achievable. You get no headaches and so on. It's in the end a choice to work with. So this is something that is really relaxing in the end to write analysis in. And the next thing is pandas. Pandas is actually something like a huge, let's call it Excel worksheet, but you don't do drag and drop with your mouse, but you yeah, change and alter the data with Python code in the end. So these are the two kind of ingredients that you need to get your software data analyzed as well. There's plenty of stuff out there as well that you can use if you need to. And another thing which is an advantage of this kind of stack you have a huge community, uh, you have plenty of open source pro um, projects and software in the end, so you get plenty of support if you use these kind of tools. And yes, ChatGPT can also give you some hints how you work with pandas in the end. So this is the basis for um, what you need to have. So if you work with C++ or with C Sharp, Java, JavaScript and so on, it's absolutely no problem to get into this kind of area as well. Another kind of ingredient we need from the tool side are computational notebooks. So we want to get together our analysis code and the data that we analyze in a certain way. So the main idea is that we combine both, like on a research paper. So this is something from Albert Einstein. Um, what he did was, for example, write down some ideas. You also see some formulas, which I totally cannot understand. And at the bottom here, you have a nice visualization that tries to, to sum, maybe to summarize, and I don't understand this research paper, but maybe it tries to summarize the main conclusions uh, out of this kind of research that he did. So the same ideas you can also use for the analysis of our software systems. Uh, for example, you can write this kind of stuff here, which in reality looks like this, which is a Jupyter notebook. So what you see here, for example, are some descriptions of what you're actually trying to achieve with your analysis. You see, for example, some analysis code here. So this is Python code with pandas. We'll get into this in a few moments. And what you also see, and what I really like, is you see immediately, immediately the, resu the results that you actually produced with your analysis code so that others can also see what you've been doing during your analysis. So this is something uh, I really like because later on you also know what you did because in the best case you wrote some pointers, uh, some small documentation, what you're trying to achieve, you have your code and the results and this step by step until you get the conclusions that you actually need for taking the next steps in your software modernization projects. So with this, I think we switch over to a little demo. So let me just switch the screen once again. I hope I don't break the recording here. So what I want to show you by now is the Jupyter Notebook system as one of those major tools that we need for doing some, or creating some comp comprehensible uh, analysis. So Jupyter Notebook in the end is some kind of a server that you start on your local machine or in the cloud. And you can open it up, it up in your browser, as you can see here. And then you can write these kind of, let's call it research paper in quotation marks, um, which we will do for one specific analysis. Um, 
So for example, we can create one notebook to write down some Python code. We open this up. Um, we get a cell. Yeah, we can write something down. But it has to be Python code, so this doesn't work, of course. Um, but if we wrap this in quotation marks, for example, we have a string. We can execute it and we see the yes, result um, under the cell immediately to yeah, get others who want to read this kind of stuff um, into our heads and that they can see what we are doing here. So what I brought with me um, is a small analysis. I would call it kind of production coverage analysis. Um, so the main idea is that we take a look at um, a measurement um, during um, the usage of a certain application and we want to see if there are parts in this kind of application that we can, in the best case, get rid of. Um, how you can do this, for example, is you, um, yeah, you get a, a, an environment where you have a software system installed, you get a profiler running, and then you record, uh, for example, all the lines of codes that were actually executed during a simulated usage of your application. One tool you can use for this in Java kind of field uh, would be Jacoco, for example. And I got a data set here that I produced a while ago, um, which we take a look at now. So this is something that you can get out of this kind of tooling. Um, you get, for example, names of packages of your Java code, uh, class names, um, the lines missed and lines covered uh, for each class. So for example, here in the first row, we see yeah, pet clinic initializer, um, lines missed zero and lines covered um, yeah, 24 in the end. So this gives you a hint how much code gets actually used when you are using your application. What we want to do, for example, in the first case, is to find out, again, if there are some parts that we can rid of, get rid of. And for this, we actually need to, um, to import um, this kind of data into pandas. So let's do this. Um, import pandas SPD um, to get this kind of dependency running. And then we can, for example, read this kind of stuff into our uh, framework in the end. And there you see, for example, we can yeah, read multiple kind of data sources, see three files, even Excel um, sheets if you want to, and we can even connect to databases, for example. So let's read this kind of um, data set in with the read CSV method. Um, yeah, we have actually to provide the string here to the data set. There's also some completion or the code completion that's working here. And if you take a look at this, if you read it into a variable like uh, coverage and we execute this kind of stuff, we see that we already have the data in hand from the data set, which is nicely formatted and displayed here on the notebook. So what I want to do here is just to add head here so that we only have the five entries here. Um, so there you see that you can then read this kind of stuff. And now we can work on this uh, data in the end. For example, maybe I have a suspicion that we have certain packages that aren't getting to used, getting, aren't getting used in the end. So maybe I want to group the packages and see how they are doing in the end. Um, for this, we need to, of course, calculate some additional metrics here. For example, the lines of code. Sorry for this. So. How does it work? It works like um, yeah, gluing together two variables in every uh, program language as well. So we need, for example, lines missed and add this kind of uh, lines covered as well to get the amount of lines of code for each class. Uh, let's do this quickly and um, yeah, let's take a look at the example or at the result in the end. So absolutely no problem to do this um, in a very few amount lines of code in the end without any four uh, loops in the end. So we just added those two columns together here. Um, what we can also do is then, for example, calculate the ratio. 
So the amount of code that's actually being used here. Um, so there, for example, we use the coverage like coverage and divide it by the complete um, amount of code for each file. Let me just see what I did here. So I have to add here a lines. And there we see the amount of code that's getting actually executed for each class. What you can do now, of course, uh, you mentioned that we also wrote some documentation during this kind of analysis. We can, for example, group this kind of data to get a higher view on this uh, data set in the end. So, for example, we are grouping by, let's say, the packages here. And we take, let's say, the mean for each uh, kind of ratio so that we know what on the average is getting executed. That is something that we can do. And because, um, yeah, we can also visualize this kind of stuff. This is what I wanted to show you. We can plot also the result here. Uh, in the default, it doesn't make sense to do this kind of stuff or this kind of, um, I'm sorry, to use this kind of uh, visualization. Um, but we can also uh, just plot the amount of code that's getting executed per packages here. And we see, for example, here, there's a package called JDBC package, which isn't actually used. So this is something maybe we we'll want to take a deeper in, uh, look into as well. So nothing complicated. You have to dive into the, the, um, the syntax, of course, of Python, but it's really, really, uh, or and pandas, but it's really, really close to the stuff that we are already doing here on a daily basis as software developers. So switching back to the slides, because you can also do some other kind of analysis, which are, let's say, a really, really uh, rare thing to do. But you can um, not only yeah, analyze your tabular data, but also something that's very interconnected. And then we are talking about graph data science, for example. So we have uh, interconnected kind of data uh, that comes from tools, for example, to Q-Assistant, which is a scanner uh, for your software data, and U4J, which is storing this kind of graph-based data. Um, what is happening here? So, for example, you have a class like a pet class, you have some fields like birth date, and a scanner like to Q-Assistant, as I told you before, scans this kind of structure, puts in a, in a graph database, and you can reason, um, again, for very particular needs um, about the software systems. So what could it be? So one kind of thing could be, it's just another visualization that it's in database. So one kind of stuff that you can do is for example, add additional measurements. So on a class level, for example, how often was this class changed? via have data from Git repositories or how much was this kind of method used here? Um, so we can combine different kind of sources together to answer very specific questions again. So this gets very detailed, of course, and this is why you can also do another approach. You can yeah, get away from this very detailed level onto a higher level by raising this kind of um, very code detailed level to a higher level. So for example, if you sort out which kind of classes belong to certain kind of let's call it subdomains or domain modules in your application, you can then also summarize some metrics that you measured for certain kinds of your, um, your, your software parts in the end. And if you do it the right way, you can bring it to a perspective when it also you as a non-developer can tell something if it's something bad or good, but also some people that have a more or less product view on a software system. But this is again something that is possible with some standard tools, with Neo4j for example, with graph databases. bases. You have to dive into this as well, but it's again standard open source tooling that you can use for your own yeah, specific analysis again. There's plenty of documentation out there, there's a great community out there that will get you into this topic as well. So to conclude and to give some pointers, we can then move on. Um, I want to yeah, actually show you again that it's not a good idea to search for one tool to rule them all, to, to give um, one kind of metric 
that can say how good your software system is doing, how good your development team is doing. This is not possible, I think, because our analysis is very context specific. The whole software development kind of activities that we do is very context dependent. So maybe you might run your own software analysis in the end. So two tips for you. What you can do, um, when you start with this, try to open up your analysis so you don't know how those tools are working at the beginning. So share this kind of analysis with your colleagues, for example. Automate the stuff that you can run all the analysis um, on your continuous integration server, for example, to get also kind of improvement work out there and visible. Um, did you see that problems go away with the time, for example? And just take a look at what you're doing with your analysis. Because you can analyze so much, but without improving something. So always take attention to the results of your analysis and try to come up with the numbers solved, uh, the numbers of problems solved in the end by your analysis. Because yeah, we have to improve our software systems and not just analyze them the whole day in the end. And with this, um, I want to thank you for paying attention here at the talk, and I'm open here for the questions, so please ask me more than yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Show of hands. In the back. Yeah. Uh, what's your academic background? Because you mentioned that uh, this approach has a background on empirical software engineering. Do you work in the area? No, I'm a Java programmer, which has the, the luck to always face legacy systems in the end. <laughs> so I'm the one who gets into soft, uh, software companies, um, gets thrown over some source code with the words, um, by the way, I quit and I leave the company <laughs> the next day. Um, so this is my, these are my situations where I then have to come up with ideas where to start getting into the software systems where the huge problems are. So I'm a Classical software engineer in the end. Um, yeah, and, and another question is uh, the type of projects you work with, do you use these techniques uh, every, single, every day? Every yeah, project? That's a good question, yeah. So I would say it's a very kind of rare thing to do. Um, I would say that if you have, let's say, 20 people working on a, a software system, you may might have one. A developer who knows this kind of stuff, and he or she is doing this like 10% and 5 or 5% 5 of his or her time. So it's a very, very rare thing to do. But if you need to do some these uh, kind of analysis, I would highly recommend that one team member knows how to do this kind of stuff, because in the end, it yeah um, spares you or saves you those huge amount of time if you know how to automate this kind of analysis. That's a very niche thing in the end, yeah. Any other questions? In that case, I have a question. Yeah. Um, would you say there's a certain size requirement to do such analysis on a project? You mean in regardless, uh, regarding classes? Or uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So you wouldn't do this for systems that are, are only 10,000 lines of code or so. So you're speaking about 100,000 lines of code and above and into millions, uh, it's no problem to analyze this as well. Yeah. So I already shared the slides here on speaker deck. If, speaker deck, if you want to find me, my handle is feststelltaste, which doesn't translate very good into English, but you can see it down here, feststelltaste, and speakerdeck.com is the website. And just that you know then what is also there in, this, in the slide deck, you have some links here to demos, so we, I, couldn't show, um, I couldn't tell about all the demos today, um, but you can look it up if you want to. And I have also a microsite, which is called softanalytics.de, the E stands for developers edition, so that you know how you can actually get into the, uh, this topic as well. There are videos on there, there are um, self-study tutorials on there, all for free. And of course, uh, books in this, Deck as well that might get you in this topic as well. So, thanks a lot. Thanks again, and have a nice evening.